Um, we'll, we'll 631 call the meeting to order. Um, first up is the consent agenda. So if any discussion, clarifications, or questions around either previous minutes, reports, or the first policy reading. I know I had one question, Lynn, about the policy. Um, I was a little confused in the, um, the section about weapons and was just wondering if you could clarify that first piece on weapons. It says inanimate and animate. And I was just curious, the animate, like just the, the, the semantics of it, like are we talking about like the, the a physical, say, ability of someone to punch someone and cause bodily harm or death? Like that's the, that's the language. And I was just curious what falls under that category of an, an animate. That was a little curious. I think you're muted, Lynn. Could you say more about where you're seeing that? So yeah. I can just Hang on a second. Let me try to find it. I have to switch to that tab. Hang on a second. Oh, I, sorry. I was not even on the right policy. No wonder. I it's, it is on page, let's see, substitute teachers. It's on, it's F2. It's page, F2, page one of two, student conduct and discipline. It's in the definition section one. It's highlighted as weapon. And it says means a device, instrument, material, or substance, whether animate or inanimate, which when used as it is intended to be used is known to be capable of producing death or serious bodily injury. I'm, I was just curious, kind of for my just, own curiosity sake, I didn't really understand what might possibly fall under the category of an, an of an animate device, instrument, material, or substance. Uh, do you want the honest answer? I am not 100% sure what would fall under inanimate. That is a definition that we took from a model policy quite some time ago, and it has not, um, that inanimate piece has not changed. So I don't know if another, if any of the principals have an example that they can think of. I cannot off the top of my head think about what would fall in that category. It's not the inanimate. For me, I was curious about just the animate. Yeah. Part. Like the inanimate I get, like a knife, a, right. a gun, any, you know, an object of sorts. I just couldn't, I was kind of just curious, what are we thinking of when we use the animate? Could it be like an attack language? dog yeah. or a snake? Right. That's what I was like a venomous snake, maybe, perhaps. I mean, it's it's fine. It's just a little semantic kind of curiosity more on my part. Yeah, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but that um, it's there for a reason. I'm certain. Um, yeah, and I would not want to change that language because that part in particular around the definitions comes from yeah. model policy. I can look okay. at that and get back to you though, Mary. It was just a. Just a question. It caught my eye. It, it's fine. I don't I mean I, it doesn't work. It doesn't warrant a, your use of your precious time right now to look into it. It covers all bases. They have me curious. So, um, any other discussion questions about the consent agenda? So, a motion to accept the consent agenda. Jean Marie. Okay, all in favor? Okay, <laughs> great. All right. So looking toward the preview and prioritization, um, we have, I don't see any real reason to switch things up in as far as the order here goes here. So we can move on then, unless anyone else feels like they wanna switch or bump things, something forward. We'll move on then with the portrait of the graduate. I would like to start uh, the portrait of a graduate piece by welcoming Wendy Baker. And I believe we have Victoria Blaney on this call. Is there another student here that I can't see? Okay, so we have, uh, Wendy has been working with us. She's the consultant that presented to the board. I think it was, it feels like a million years ago at this point in the year. Um, 
I, but I think it was just maybe December that Wendy came and spoke with the board. So she has been um, moving forward with work with our students around developing our FNESU portrait of a graduate. And she has had an active group of students that were working on this pre-COVID-19. Uh, and then the plan had to dramatically shift post-COVID-19. So our timeline's a little off and the design of the work uh, has shifted a little bit. But I know Wendy and Victoria are here. Thank you both. Uh, Victoria, I, I'm hearing that you've been a really active part of this process. So I want to thank you for that. I, I'm very proud of you and all the hard work that you've put in here. So I know I'm excited and I know that other people in this call are excited to hear from both of you to see what the students came up with. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I have a just some talking points to share with you all. Let me let me try and uh, share my screen here. Um, oops. I just, oh, wait a minute. There you are. Okay. How's that? Okay. All right. So this is a this is a progress report. Um, as Lynn said, we have had um, really some wonderful resources that have helped us uh, so far. We've had thirteen fabulous um, students um, from all the Franklin Northeast towns represented, and um, and and they've been engaged. They they showed up. I think on their first meeting. Not entirely sure what it was that their principals had recommended that they do, but ready to be of service and support. And um, and they their trajectory through the process, I think, has been pretty amazing. We also um, had the help of Nate DeMars, um, who he was our host since um, our group met at uh, Cold Hollow, and and he really connected us with um, everybody that we asked. Um, for help connecting with to gain information and things like that and so i just i just want to thank him for that um and then we uh, courtney has uh, fletcher has also been a fabulous help in that she she has um, joined in in our work and has really helped to make sure we have all the right notes and that we're keeping track of things and she's primarily been the um fn fen fnesu phase for the students to make sure that they had an internal connection um, so, um, so, and she tracks them all down. She makes sure they have lunch. She's, she's really been pretty instrumental in, in keeping them going since we all know lunch is a critical element of any program. So, um, in our collaboration so far, we met for two full days. Um, I gave them homework ahead of time. Um, we, we sort of looked into a number of different things together. Our third day was supposed to be March 24th. If you remember right, we were planning to come to you April 13th with this progress report. So um, we obviously did not meet together face-to-face -face March 24th. We quickly changed horses and traded that time for some virtual work that we've done together as well as um, in pairs and small groups. And, and I would say that roughly we've had about half of the students of that group um, tremendously engaged, you know, since that time, which is, you know, something that, um, you know, once we go virtual, I know that everybody in the school district is really working hard to ensure that everybody stays engaged. So, so that's, that's kind of part of what I'm sure, you know, Lynn has talked a lot about in, in this transition. Together, we first, first thing we did was we brainstormed, well, what do you think characteristics of a high school graduate should be? Um, you know, without any looking into anything, you know, just let's just make a list, you know, of, of what you think that, that, um, that maybe a uh, high school graduate should have or should be able to do when they graduate. Uh, and then we went out to portrait of a graduate work that's being done all over the country and in other countries and looked at, you know, what is everybody saying? And, and the kids were great. They were like, wow, other people are having these conversations too. And look in Chicago, they want this. And so that was very eye opening for them um, that different parts of the country were interested in different, um, you know, um, aspects of what a high school graduate should be able to do and although we haven't followed the the um the process that the portrait of a graduate kind of folks 
um, have, have put together and, and um, trademarked. Um, we were very grateful for their resources in terms of where other people are doing this work and what that looks like. The kids learned a lot from that. We conducted interviews. People came to us, a Senator Parent. Um, we interviewed some folks in the business world as well as um, uh, a newspaper reporter who did a, a pretty nice article, but we also interviewed him too. Um, and the uh, folks, um, somebody from Paul Smith's College who stopped by, as well as somebody from the White Mountains Community College um, who stopped by because it was really important to the students that we were taking into account what every single type of pathway might mean. So if you wanted to go into the military, or if you wanted to um, go into higher education or straight into the workforce, you know, or anything else we could dream up, this would apply to you too. So they were very inclusive together um, around that. And, and that was helpful. Had we met on the third day, we would have, um, we would have met with somebody um, in HR from um, the uh, hospital system, but obviously that wasn't something that was going to come to pass. Um, and we also would have met with another local business person, you know, just, just to kind of triangulate some of our findings so far relative to what people were thinking. Um, so at the conclusion of this stage, we had a list of 26 characteristics. And those 26 characteristics came from everything that the students uh, researched out into the world on their own, the conversations they had, the things that people that they met with told them and shared with them, and the way that they responded to their questions. It was then time to um, begin to gather some other electronic feedback from the community at large, both the student community as well as um, the, uh, the adults in the community to the extent that, that we could. So we came up with three questions that we wanted to ask. Um, and Courtney was very helpful in helping us to create a, um, a Facebook survey for students and for community members that essentially asked these three questions. And we had approximately 50 general community members respond and we had um, about 80 students, which was um, equally divided between Richford and Enosburg, also respond in their feedback. Um, and the students conducted, you know, about 10 interviews with adults that I know some of the board members, you know, some of you perhaps, you know, help to guide them and give them some names and make some connections. And, uh, you know, they, they, um, they didn't understand why everybody they emailed didn't get back to them right away, you know, which is just all of this has been a lesson in how the world works, you know, and how to put those things together, which has been great fun to support them in. Um, so, so far, you know, they, they had a chance to, to have about 10 um, face to, just over the phone or face to face interviews. Some of them took place in grocery stores, which I thought to be fairly interesting. So from that, um, we, we have, we've generally come to consensus around seven characteristics. And um, if, if it's okay with you, uh, Mary, I'd like to just kind of run through each seven to just give you a sense of what they're thinking about. Um, emotionally uh, intelligent, that um, encompasses four areas. Self-regulation, um, essentially the, the ability to read a social situation, to interact with that social situation, and also to um, be aware yourself of your own emotions. So it kind of runs the gamut of what's happening with you and what's happening outside of you. Information savvy um, is the ability to know when information needs to be discovered, how to get it, how to evaluate it, and how to also produce and create it. Um, the kids had a really interesting conversation between what is required of them in a tech savvy world and really what, what does it look like actually to be information savvy. And it was very clear through the data that we collected that being information savvy was really what um, it boiled down to that students need to be able to do. Financial literacy, um, that is the ability to generate, invest, spend, and save money. They deliberately chose um, financial literacy or financially literate versus being financially responsible. 
because they felt that financially responsible is, is, is more about like making sure they don't do the wrong thing. And they really um, felt it was important that by the time every student graduates from high school, they know something productive about those four elements. Um, and that actually was one of the characteristics that was on the kid's mind from the first day before they even looked into something else. One of the interesting points they made about that was that not every parent has had the same level of financial success. And, and so not having that be something that the school takes a very active role in, they felt was um, absolutely uh, putting them at a significant disadvantage. So, um, so that one has, um, has stayed on the list from the very beginning. Um, and it's only grown um, after they had people talk to them about you know, the, the reality that students in high school, I mean, as they move, the high school age students, as they move on to their careers, they're going to have to diversify. They're going to have to have a job. They're going to have to have an apartment building. They're going to have to, you know, have a side hustle, all of those kinds of things, um, really, in order to be able to withstand, uh, you know, economic uncertainty, which obviously we're all more familiar with at the moment than we ever have been before. Um, Independent decision makers, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that the students were very clear on was that most of, um, most of what happens with them in their lives at home and in their lives at school is they are asked to comply with various, you know, requests of adults and, um, and, and, you know, sometimes they're asked to generate things, but really they're not, they're not given the opportunity to make a lot of decisions about what it is that they're doing. Um, and uh, one of the frustrations that they expressed about that is that, especially those that were on, on the older end of the spectrum, is that as, you know, when they're starting to make decisions, they're huge decisions, like relationship decisions or college decisions or employment decisions or do i buy a car or do i and they really haven't had very much practice so they felt it was very important that um that the school takes uh, a strong role in in being able to support students to be independent decision makers that can can excel when the time comes for them to be um, in a position to make some pretty significant life decisions at least they're very significant in their mind at that time Creative thinkers, you know, really is kind of um, the way they've thought about that is being able to um, look at things in new ways so that you understand how everybody's looking at it or how you might look at it, but also be able to look at it in new ways, whether it's a problem or something that you're just trying to invent or think about in a different way. Trustworthy um, meant gain the confidence of others. It meant gain the confidence of others of a variety of different perspectives, you know, cultural perspectives, generational perspectives, um, you know, just ethnic perspectives, but you would gain the confidence of others. That includes things like, um, you know, being able to show initiative, have integrity, do your work, have work, you know, strong work ethic, um, do what you've said that you're going to do, things of that nature. And, What's interesting is that most of the characteristics that uh, the students had originally on their list actually dialed back into being trustworthy, um, which has a, just a strong uh, community value base, you know, which they could identify readily. And the last one was to be a contributor. This um, area is, is something that um, broadens the concept of initiative. What they heard very loudly from all of the different people that they spoke with is that um, they need to understand how to make a positive contribution, whether that's on a team, whether it's as a cashier at, a, at a, an entry level job, whether it is as a, um, as, you know, as, as somebody who's starting out in an, in an entry level, you know, position beyond high school, not necessarily working at a convenience store during high school or something of that nature, or whether it's being part of a, a much bigger project. Um, but the idea of what it means to be a contributor is something that um, they thought this would be good language for the school to take on and, and a good characteristic for all high school students to look at. Um, in fact, 
I think it is, that's probably the most uneven characteristic among the group. There are, um, there were students who had a much better sense of that than others. Um, and so that was a way that that playing field could have been made much, um, much, much more equal. So let me just kind of finish up here and then maybe we'll circle back to this slide if you have questions or, or um, want to talk more. So um, what we as a group understand to be kind of next steps is that um, um, if, if it's your pleasure, we would be um, supporting other broader educators to consider kind of the concepts behind these seven characteristics. The students did as a, as a last activity, take a look at the Vermont portrait of a graduate, a language which has just recently been released, I think last week as a matter of fact. Um, and they, they saw everything on that list that they have, but they felt very good uh, about the way they were thinking about that. And, and that's maybe something, Victoria, that you can speak to as we, as we, as we um, move on to the, to the question and comment phase. Um, so, so really kind of broadening this conversation among the educators and, and seeing what they think uh, about sort of their draft language and draft characteristics. and then. Um, pulling the students back together to take a look at what their feedback was and finalize that. They were very in favor of this um, movement being something that is, is on some level continuing to be led by students. So that the languages we as the students of Franklin Northeast feel that this is important for us as graduates, something of that nature. I don't know how you would feel about that, but that's something I told them I would pass along to you. And they felt that given all the circumstances about the way this school year is ending, that maybe the next um, step that, that uh, we might be able to continue after that is to create some materials that would enable students and staff to work together to sort of pilot implementation. The students, um, there's some of them that would like to continue to kind of keep talking about this work during the next academic year and see if there are refinements that need to be made or you know, other pieces that, that they want to think about. That's, that's all I have as a sort of by way of opening comments or, or story to share. And, and I, I um, Mary would be happy to take other questions or, or perhaps Victoria has some, some insights that she'd like to share. Thanks, Wendy. That's really superb. I mean, I really appreciate that insight into the process. It looks like a lot of time and energy and heart went into crafting that. Um, there, the, 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 we have one student in the conversation here, right, on the Zoom? Does, yes, Victoria. Does Victoria want to add anything to uh, what you just said, Wendy? I don't see her on my screen. She is holding a horse, and I would love it if she would add something. Hi. So, yes, I am a part of the Portrait of a Graduate Committee, and I actually was not a part of the first meeting. So I was, I came later in the game, and um, where a lot of my peers had already created a list, and I'd already watched a movie and been a part of a few interviews. And so I was going off of what they had already said. And then I put my insight into what they had said and we were finalizing our list. So I was able to be a part of the voting process where we were able to finalize and cut down our list and create categories as well. And what we found, especially when we were doing our virtual meetings, is that a lot of these categories, they connect, but they don't overlap. And something that we also found interesting is that when we're looking at the Vermont State Portrait of a Graduate, is that they include a humanities aspect and being able to um, um, I don't know how to say this exactly, but to um, like respect other cultures as well. And what we found is that our categories that 
falls under all of our categories as well. So we decide not to add that directly into our group. So the global citizenship, um, Victoria, I think that's the phrase you were looking for, is embedded within their explanation of each of the seven characteristics as opposed to a standalone, which you will find on the Vermont State. That's a great point, Victoria. Thanks for mentioning that. Nice. Thank you for sharing, Victoria. Does the board have any questions of Wendy or of Victoria? I just wanted to add something. Thank you so much for this work, Wendy. I know we've, we've talked a lot about it, to, so to be able to see, you know, maybe not exactly a finished product, but to see all the progress that you guys have made and the effort that you've put in is really, really helpful. Um, and it's a tremendous amount of work, so I really appreciate that. <clears throat> I just wanted to share with you folks that um, my day job, I work in higher education, and one of the things that we hear from the employers is a lot of these things that you've listed out. You know, that they want employees who are you know tech savvy and are you know have all of those things that and um, like the emotional intelligence. That those are the things that we all sort of assume everyone already has, but we don't put any effort into teaching folks. So I think it's just really valuable that that came up and that, you know, hopefully that'll be something that we'll be able to continue to address as we move forward. So thank you for that. Wendy, I'm curious um, in others across the state and across the country when, um, school districts have kind of worked on those next steps and kind of taking the vision and the, the visioning process and kind of uh, working toward actualizing it in the kind of school setting. What, how, I'm sure it looks really different in different places, but can you talk a little bit or about just kind of contextualize, like what do those next steps look like and what, you know, are does it involve kind of the development of a new class, for instance, like a class that teaches some of those aspects around, you know, financial literacy and, you know, um, the emotional intelligence? I mean, there are there are already parts of the curriculum that kind of have can kind of contain some of what's on that list. But then there are things that are kind of outside of how we're currently educating kids in the district. So I'm just curious to see, you know, what, what does that look like in other places and how have they done those next kind of steps toward actualizing those kind of desires and goals that the students are identifying um, that they want, you know, that they're, they're kind of craving for as they kind of head through high school and beyond. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right, Mary, in that it, it, it does look a difference depending upon what the areas of focus are and also what you already have in place, you know, and, and what that looks like. I think one of the things that you're doing that's very different from how uh, this is usually done is you, you are letting the students um, have, have some leadership in this work. And so that means that, um, you know, the, the, the adults now, you know, the, the uh, administrators and the educators and, and whatnot will have a chance to take their feedback, take a look at existing proficiencies, existing work that you have, see where that's mapped out and, and be able to uh, make some determinations about what work needs to be highlighted at a different level and what work needs to be developed from scratch because it's not really there and also you know maybe what um does this suggest about letting something go i mean i think the um the way that i've heard jody and lynn talk about moving ahead is always in emphasizing um an, an embedded approach you know so because because whenever you're trying to build really important um, characteristics in kids like these, you, you need to do it over time and in a spiraled way, you know? So, so that I'm guessing would, um, I mean, I would certainly defer to Jody or Lynn, you know, to, to speak more about your own context, but, but I, I think you, you have, 
you have allowed the students to do some thinking about this and and we've we've been careful to present it as a draft as draft thinking you know um and so that they can hopefully work in partnership with the educators you know um along the way to keep this moving in a way that really is engaging the students because they have a sense of agency around, you know, where they're going and what that looks like. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yep. I think that's really, um, I was really excited to see what they came up with because I, I had not, I had not seen it in advance. And I think I saw it maybe two days ago, but I hadn't heard all of the kind of explanation for each of the seven categories. And I, I just think it, it's, it's really awesome. I think that there are several of those categories that like the emotional intelligence piece, the trustworthiness uh, piece, uh, and the contribute contributors. I think that there are some elements there that we're thinking about in terms of how we can universally provide some direct instruction for all kids, because those are things that somebody said it earlier. I think, I think it was Jean Marie. We sometimes expect kids to have those characteristics or traits when in reality, not all kids have ever been taught those things or have, have even really unpacked what does it mean to be um, emotionally intelligent or consider another person's feelings in a, in, a, in a social situation. So I think that this perfectly aligns with some of the work that we are already doing. And I can definitely see some areas that the students have recommended that would make sense for us to consider as we move forward because we're maybe not spending as much time focusing on a couple of these areas and this is some good um good opportunity for growth for us so i i appreciate the the pathway that we took with this that it started with the students and i think that you know the part about the students having the agency in this is is really important i think that it, it will be an important next step for us to get this in front of our educators to take a look at and I appreciate that the students still want to be involved beyond this part of the process because I don't think that's what we had originally asked to them in the beginning. So I, it, it says a lot about the process for them to want to hang on and keep working at this. So I think you must have done a really nice job with them, Wendy. <laughs> I don't know. It's a little, it's, it's been a little, long, a little ways since I've been with a, a group of 13 high school students for six <laughs> hours continuously so <laughs> they were a great group of students and they made it fun you know every ounce of it was fun awesome can i can i just add something um that was said in the last meeting with the students recognize that this whole like is ever evolving um so they they still want to be involved but they know that the qualities will change over time so they want more they want like newer generations of students to be involved too. So they want students to keep being involved even when they are gone because they know that all of these characteristics will change. So I thought that was pretty cool too. That is neat. Well, thank you, Victoria and Wendy. That was really excellent and um, really uh, inspiring to, to hear. I appreciate that so much. Thank you for the opportunity. It's it's been great fun, um, and uh, you know it, it's it's been nice to keep the kids going in such a strange environment too. You know, right? So, um, so Lynn, we, I'll just sort of wait for you and and Jody for to give some direction about how you'd like to take next steps after you have a chance to talk about that. And uh, both, I believe, Morgan and um, Courtney have access to the presentation. So if you need it or would like it to be part of the board minutes or in any way, then I'm sure that they can facilitate that. Okay, we will be in touch. Good. And Victoria, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I wish you well in the rest of your work. Thank you. Um, Morgan, do you know if we have uh, visitors uh, that need to be recognized for public comment? Um, Anne does not need to be recognized. Uh, we've got uh, Emily Grimms and Caroline, I assume Elander in as well. I don't know if they have any business for the board. No, I'm fine. 
Nothing from Caroline, just listening. Same for Emily, thanks. Okay, great. Um, so moving on to central office updates, um, Dominic, uh, you are up with your techno technology update. Okay. Hey, um, so yeah, just to uh, a couple quick updates on where we are with things. Um, since it's been a little while since we uh, spoke, uh, um, we did get uh, devices sent home for you know, lots of students. Um, we're um, every town, every school we have at, at least grade three through and up um, are covered with devices at home. Some schools they went much lower. Some a uh, couple schools are even kindergarten and up um, that we have devices sent home for. Um, and our schools have also been doing a lot of work around helping students with connectivity. Um, let me just take a look at the numbers. Um, so we did surveys and, and well, started with the survey, but really it was our schools, our principals and teachers doing a lot of work, uh, actually calling families to see, you know, who has internet access at home and who doesn't. Um, and we came up with, you know, percentage wise, it doesn't sound too bad, about 7% of our students didn't have internet access. Um, but in actual numbers, that means that it's about 130 students without it. Um, and you know, so uh, we've been doing a lot of work, our schools have been doing a lot of work um, around uh, you know, working with families, making sure that they're aware of some of the uh, offerings that are out there from Comcast and Consolidated, um, you know, AT&T, they'll have good um, things that they're offering to help people get connected. And we've got, um, our latest numbers are showing where, and I, I didn't get updates from everybody, but an estimated, I think we've knocked off about 40 of those. So we've gone from around 130 without access to roughly 90 without access now. Um, and some of those do have uh, you know, plans or they've worked with one of the um, service providers and they're on the schedule. It's just that they got backed up pretty quickly. And the last I heard uh, consolidated is scheduling into June at this point for you know any new connect connections. So, so hopefully those numbers will keep uh, going down as we move forward. I think that's it for me, unless there's any questions. I just wonder, Dominic, if you um, had some categories of the folks who didn't have internet connection. Like, I think that there are some families who don't want it. There are some families who can't afford it. And then probably families who, like, can't act. There is no option for it. Is, are there other categories or is that – I'm just curious. Um. I think you covered it pretty well right there. Those are the three categories that I've heard. Um, principals may, you know, they have more uh, firsthand knowledge than I do, so they may know more, but those, I've definitely heard all three of those um, numerous times. So, and especially like Bakersfield and I guess, well, several of our towns really, but we've got a lot of students who live, you know, up on back roads and stuff where access is really tough you know some some of them you know if we can't get um consolidated or or uh you know comcast is mostly main roads and within towns um you know at and is still kind of hit or miss this is becoming such a hot topic i know i was talking with our friend lisa hango and you know the idea that internet connectivity is needs to be as easily accessible as um, electricity and telephone lines were so that that time is coming I'm sure but we need it now and it will come later unfortunately right yeah Ho hopefully with what's happening now it kind of is pushing that more to the forefront and getting some more focus on it, and hopefully that'll help us move to where we should be um, Dominic, it seems like for those families that still don't have access to the internet for whatever kind of set of circumstances, with the kids in the younger grades, it seems a little 
easier as far as packets and worksheets and such, but I imagine there's a threshold grade wise and kind of for the continuity of learning where it really starts to impede that child's ability to kind of keep up with what's being presented on the daily. Do if God forbid this extended into the fall, which, you know, no one has a crystal ball right now, it seems like there'd be a much greater urgency mm -hmm. to really dial in for these families, especially, I mean, we can't run power line, you know, DSL lines, but if for those families that are falling under the kind of financial kind of limitation kind of arm of the situation, I wonder if we can have budget conversations or if there will be money available through some of the pandemic relief where we could help families access, you know, a, a basic internet packages. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Morgan, if there's been any talk about that. I mean, it would probably wouldn't be something we could manifest in, in short order, but if we were heading into the fall, it may be worth having on our radar because I can't imagine, you know, for high schoolers and even our middle schoolers not having, you know, access to these Google classrooms and stuff that everyone is doing almost on the daily. Yeah. So I'll jump in here. Uh, um, it, this is definitely about ready for the Lee Mary, and they have an explore. Sorry, I guess I was muted. Students so have already made this a priority and they've been exploring some of those very things. I know that um, we have had some, like our PTO in one of our towns has taken an active role and has donated some funding to some families in need and the principals are trying to be really creative about our families that the, the cost of it is really the barrier. So I 100% agree that this is a priority and Morgan and I were both on a, and I think you were too, Mary, the joint fiscal yeah. office call earlier. And one of the things we heard from um, Representative Welch's, um, one of the people from his team today was in this, in they hope in future COVID relief money, um, they hope that it will be connected to the kind of the last mile efforts around making sure that all people in Vermont have broadband accessibility uh, throughout the state. So I think that that everybody's paying attention to this and the reality is that we we could be looking at this beyond this year. So it the emphasis really does, um, it makes it even more important than it is right now, thinking about it in terms of an extended period. You can brush, I'm not on video. Yeah, and I'll also add um, to your point of it being even more important for the some of the older students that um, luckily looking at our numbers, we've had lower percentages in the high upper grades. So most of our high school and middle school students are covered by internet and we're seeing bigger numbers for the younger grades that aren't. Um, and I know our high schools have been, you know, doing a lot of work too to try to make those connections happen. Right. All right. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, Jody, you're up next. Okay. So we made it through the um, the planning for the continuation of learning. We are a little bit into our second week here. Um, we I sent you the link to a draft of. Uh, survey that we are going to send to students and families to get some feedback about how it's going and there also will be a survey going to teachers at the end of this week to get some more information about how things are going and what people need and what kind of support that they need um, and also i sent you the link to the site that was built as a teacher resource uh, by the curriculum team and by the tech folks so that the teachers have access all in one place. I don't know about it's anybody else, but Jody keeps going farther away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I had unstable connection all day. Mm. Is that any better? No. It's just very faint, Jody. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's better. It. That's better. Yep. Oh, okay. I didn't do anything, but <laughs> I'm glad it's better. So I had sent you the link to the survey and the link to the um, continuity of learning, uh, continuation of learning site. And um, those have been just the big projects for the curriculum team, figuring out what the teachers need and trying to provide that to them. And also at the same time, trying to figure out what our students and our families need and trying to provide that to them. So that was all I had to report, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Jody, you sent out the survey already. Have you started two families? Have you gotten I have any not, back? I haven't sent it out to families yet. Ah, okay. um, I wanted to wait until a week from today so that there have been enough time because uh, we had that break. We started with the continuation of learning and then there was break. And then we were back for just a little bit. So I wanted to send it out the end of this week or the beginning of next week so that families have had enough time to settle in a little bit. Perfect. Okay. Anything else for Jody? Okay, Michelle, you are up. Okay. Hi, everybody. I have... Um, a couple things. I'll start with a little bit about special ed and remote services has been um, tricky to say the least. So Robin and I have spent a lot of time together. We should probably share a house and bills, but um, so special educators and speech language pathologists all had to create what we're calling DLPs in the special ed world, which are distance learning plans and these it's basically an agreement with a family of what kind of services they um, would like during um, during remote learning so how can we provide services related to their students disability and how can we tie this to a goal and we've had to document all of this so we've had some, we have incredible um, staff that are doing some pretty amazing things with kids and figuring this out very quickly. So very impressed with um, all of our, all of our special educators and counselors and speech language pathologists. Um, Robin, am I missing anything on that part? Oh, we also um, provided all teachers with um, ideas around different accommodations and modifications that they can make to curriculum that's going home to students so that we can make sure that we're meeting the needs of all kids based on their disability to lessen the stress for families. Um, the only thing that I would add is, um, you know, we certainly are not providing the level of service that students get on a, you know, typical day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Um, we've had to be very creative and I think what we've encouraged our teachers to do is really take the lead of families um, and what they're wanting for their family and their child or their children um, and, and some of that looks like some direct service that's happening through Google Hangout, Google Meet. Um, some of our teachers are um, providing like mini lessons through videos that students are able to view at their own leisure um, and then respond um, to different learning materials with that. Uh, some of our staff are um, not necessarily providing direct instruction for a various of reasons. However, uh, they're offering um, trainings to parents throughout the week, whether it's once or twice a week check-in um, for some students with some of the more significant disabilities. Um, we've had families that have really wanted, you know, a range of services, and I think we've tried to do our best to accommodate that. Um, just families are in very different places, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, so really it was, you know, what do you as a family want for your child during this time? Uh, what are you willing to kind of help with, especially for our younger children that um, are not able to just kind of easily log on and participate like that and really need some parental or some guardianship guidance around that. Um, so there's lots of different things being done. So as board members, you may hear families talk about, you know, sometimes it's a call to just kind of do a social emotional check in. There's some direct service happening. There's some parent trainings happening. Um, lots of consultation. So looks very we've different. Had, we've had to be really creative. Like our occupational therapist and physical therapists have put like um, plastic 
containers full of supplies and ship them home to families with directions on how kids can can still access their OT and their PT. So some pretty creative things going on for a lot of our students. So pretty exciting stuff. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit um, and talk about next year, some program planning that we are um, gonna move forward with. So Louise Green, who has been a special educator for a long time at Enosburg High School, and she has been in charge of what we call our TAPS program, which is, it stands for Transitioning into Adult Programs and Services. So she's retiring, and that worried me for a while of who are we going to find to fill this position, which is, you know, has unique needs. And Beth and I are really excited that we found um, a special educator that has an endorsement in um, intensive needs. And she's also in finishing up a program to have a certificate in autism as well. And so we started thinking with the merge, how we can um, offer both schools the same level of trained personnel. So Joseph, Beth, Robin, Lynn and I met multiple times to kind of talk about how could we build stronger programs together and looking more that we are um, one school with two campuses and we decided that since this woman came along and and she was going to um, and she has anyway so she has the level of experience that we were looking for that she could be in charge of this TAPS program and would be housed at Richford High School because in Enosburg we have a behavioral program that is called we're going to call it STEP which stands for Student Therapeutic Educational Placement Program and so that's something that uh, Lindsay runs at Enosburg High School and it's um, like a small it's it's a public school environment where kids have access to therapeutic services supports and appropriate program where there's probably what seven to ten kids Joseph in a in a class together very small individualized um, supports academically and emotionally um, and so since we already had that established in going in Enosburg, we thought it'd be great that either Richford Enosburg kids could access that program in Enosburg and then Enosburg Richford kids could access the TAPS program, which would be housed in Richford. And Beth and Joseph, please jump in if I'm missing anything. <clears throat> Any questions, concerns about before we jump to questions or concerns, I just want to give a little of the context around why we're thinking this way. So these are not inexpensive programs to run. Um, and I think that one of the things that we've been trying to do strategically is to think about how can we provide programming options in Franklin Northeast that allow us to keep more of our students within our own communities so we're we're trying to really strengthen what it is we're offering and rather than trying to replicate both of those programs in both schools the challenge was around how can we make one really strong program um, focused on you know the more of the behavioral element and then one really strong program really focused on the developmental delay aspect um, as well so it, it is much more affordable to do one program than two um, and our numbers are small enough that we feel like we can be pretty effective with the uh, size of the groups combined between the two communities <clears throat> that's where we're coming from with the theory beyond behind this correct so we probably had like five or six students in enosburg five or six students in in Richford and so it would make it be fiscally responsible to combine those as well as um, you know finding good match of staffing as well 
Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, from a, a fiscal and programmatic perspective, I think the because the staff in both schools possess the training background and skill set that are needed to serve the needs of our kids, um, we're in a better place to do early intervention and to save uh, on the ultimate cost of very expensive residential facilities um, and those kinds of services that are very costly outside of school, a school-based setting. Um, and because that's the stuff they would be getting in the residential stuff, so we can offer that right here um, because we've had uh, increased professional development in those areas. So I'm pretty excited about it. I also feel like it's a way to integrate the work that um, Wendy Baker and, and the students who work so hard on Portrait of a Graduate, we can do that work here in terms of the social emotional uh, skill training, et cetera. So I was pretty excited about that uh, presentation tonight on Portrait of a Graduate and um, seeing how the programs that we're doing, um, that stuff that Wendy and the kids have been doing is also part of the behavioral programs in both schools. Thank you, Mark. Can I just add that um, Louise Green has a unique skill set and we've been very fortunate to have her skills in our supervised reunion for the number of years and we were worried about replacing her and then we got this application um, for a special educator that wanted to work at Richford High School and when we interviewed her we were very very pleased with her ex not only her education but her experience she ran an alternative program at CBU and at MVU and has done some extensive programming with kids with developmental delays so she asked to work at Richford so it made sense to house that program at Richford because we are very excited to have her yes she did ask for Richford and she's moving to the area and so that's a, definitely a bonus for sure and she was like I lost my train of thought but she was going She's worked at MVU for the last like five or six years and then she was at CBU and she has a ton of experience with all outside agencies and how to get kids into the community and into um, the workforce. So super excited about having her. Nice. It sounds excellent. She sounds like a great asset to the to the SU. That's that's superb. Are there Michelle, any about the, any, I'm just curious if there are questions about the program design aspect of this. Okay. Lynn, do you mean uh, as far as it being kind of split between the, the two arms of it being split between the two high schools? Yes. I think it makes, a, I mean, I, I think it makes a, a lot of sense. It's, seems streamlined and kind of very well thought out. Yeah, so I was actually wondering a little bit logistically how that was gonna happen, but. I was just gonna say logistically, I think we still have some of the details to work out. Um, there are some um, particular things that are offered, like Enosburg currently has the JROTC that a couple of our students are involved in. So there are some things that we need to um, work through to figure out how we can continue to have students engaged in things that they've been engaged in. Um, so there's definitely some logistical detailed work that we still need to work through. Um, but broadly, we wanted to make sure that the board was aware of this um, because our next step is really to start informing families um, of both Richford and Enosburg if if the intention is for their child to be attending the alternative campus. Um, you know, and we're not sure, um, you know, how families may or may not feel about that. Um, so, you know, it's important that you guys are aware of sort of why we're thinking of this and why we're doing what we're doing um, moving forward. So I don't know that I can answer the logistical pieces. There's some things around transportation, which we already have a lot of existing transportation in place. Um, so it's not like we have to add those types of things on, um, but just figuring out what that's gonna mean for schedules, you know, what time of the day these student schedules are gonna start, um, 
things like that. Those are all things that are next steps for us as administrators to kind of work through. Um, but broadly, we wanted to make sure that um, this knowledge base was presented. Are, are there families for whom it might be a hardship if say they live in Richford, but the program that's more appropriate for their child is in Enosburg? Are you anticipating challenges around that? I mean, we'll, I mean, obviously we'll provide transportation, eh? Yes. Right. We have, the, I think we have that part figured out. I think it's, it's the students who are currently like juniors going to be seniors. We're not going to ask them to shift. We we're going to present what we're going to have um, for staffing and where it's going to be. But I think we might phase out the students who are already like we went, who already are in the program. So if we have a junior is going to be a senior next year, and then we like in Enosburg and say, okay, next year you have to go to Richford for your your senior year. That will be an option if they want to be a part of the program. If not, we'll make some adjustments and um, work with that student. And then like the incoming eighth grader or ninth grader or freshman would go to Richford to access this program. So we just have a handful of students to take into their the you know the the needs of them for the rest till we phase them out basically. If that the makes other, sense. The other aspect too is the um, we're not saying that the child doesn't isn't going to be enrolled in their home school. So right. even if they're a Richford student attending Enosburg for the behavioral program, they still can be considered a Richford student. They still can uh, they can still earn a, a Richford diploma. So we're, we're not looking at changing that home school. It's just their placement and their services are going to be housed uh, in that other school. So that, that is one of the pieces that I think for, for some families, that's going to be an important question for them. But we'll take care of the logistics. This won't be anything that costs families um, any more money or anything like that. We won't be expecting uh, an added burden for transportation. We'll take care of those pieces. Right. I think we had the busing almost figured out. Yeah. And just a question, the kids that are in these in these programs, is it separate, a completely kind of separate day from peers or is there kind of a, a fluidity to moving back and forth between some mainstream classes and then parts of this program? Exactly, fluid. Yeah. And varied. So some students may um, be integrated into one general general ed class. Others may be three or four, depending on where their strengths are. Um, and another thing that Michelle and I are looking at, especially for the TAPS program, which will be housed at Richford High School, is um, kind of what the, the learner profile is. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. We're just trying to streamline um, sort of what students kind of meet the, the criteria to be within that kind of a program. Right. Even the geographical location of the program here at Enosburg is moving from the basement up to the first floor um, to be more integrated with the rest of the school. So those kids are no longer going to be in the basement. They're going to be in the lower level. They're going to be up on the first floor with everybody else. Great. Yep. All right. Michelle, is that, is that it for you? Are you, are you all set? I am. I have one more thing. Sorry. Okay. No, not at all. So I, for the last couple of years, we have been looking for a, a second school psychologist. We've had the job opening for, I don't know what, three years now that we haven't been able to fill in with our kind of ties into the portrait of a grad. So with um, the need for the increase in social emotional uh, opportunities for kids and, and the need for some sort of curriculum around this, I was doing a lot of thinking after we hired Heather and Crystal and we have this behavior team, what else I could do to support students with social emotional learning. And so I decided to switch the job description to a school psychologist slash social emotional learning coach. So my hopes for this position would 
we need somebody to do cognitive testing. So I still need a school psychologist so that they can help support Christine, who's our other school psychologist. But we've also had an increase in threat, the need for threat assessments. And we don't really have a system in place around the procedures for threat assessment. So this person would help design um, risk assessments and threat assessments. Um, it would give us an opportunity for a school psychologist to be a part of the MTSS process and be involved in EST meetings, which has not happened because we've only had one school psychologist. Um, but the, the biggest role that I would like this person to do, and I found someone who has experience in this, so I'm super excited that they could do, um, some risk behavior surveys with our students and they would be able to use that information to, so it's, it's a screener to be able to identify student needs. They would even be able to, he would even be able to, by looking at this data, identify like certain grade levels in certain classrooms that have um, more significant needs than others where they, he, we can focus interventions and of course my dog is gonna bark right when I'm talking. Um, more interventions um, help a classroom teacher with coaching, um, help integrate in, in some of the social emotional learning that is um, so necessary in a lot of our classrooms. So kind of shifting this role, I'm sorry, hold on. Sorry, my lovely children. Um, so I want this person to be like a coach. I want them to help uh, collect data to be able to identify the necessary needs in particular schools, to work with classroom teachers, to be um, a school psychologist. So I have a lot of, a lot of dreams for this person, but I found somebody who is interested in the position um, if approved by the board. So kind of excited to have him join our, our uh, team if that's the direction we go in. But kind of, he just got his, um, this person, his name is Nick and he has his, he wants to be a principal someday and wants to take on some leadership roles. So he was really interested in this position. So just kind of wanted to give you my thoughts. And I also have been thinking that we have the behavior program that's nine through 12th grade that's housed at Enosburg. And I'm really interested in creating an alternative program for elementary school. And so that could also be part of this design with his support and Christine. So now, now I'm all done. Thank you. Robin, do you have anything further? No, but you can see she keeps me busy. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely tell. We got to make her dreams a reality. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> lots of ideas. Great. All right. Thanks. Uh, so, Heather, you are up. Hello. Um, yeah. So, Leaps, um, we've been doing um, in the different programs, um, some online program opportunities for the youth. Um, a couple of the big ones, um, D and D has been really popular with um, the middle high school groups, um, and we've been using um, platforms called Flipgrid. Uh, Jody introduced it to us uh, to help with cooking instruction. We're working on some online um, farm to school program options as well as. Um, so having our garden instructors do some work on the school gardens and uh, with some uh, recording of it and helping the students maybe with some gardening tips and stuff um, and trying to offer some more social emotional opportunity for the students um, to engage with online as well as um, some activity packets in some of the programs. Uh, so this is what we've been trying to do right now. Um, realizing that uh, not all the kids were online at first and that um, we're trying to just like focus on some um, 
kind of like the fun aspects of like being online sometimes for, where they can kind of socialize during this um, social distancing uh, world that we're in right now. Uh, the big topic for us uh, really is trying to figure out summer. Um, we're hoping to have guidance and we're hoping to have clear guidance on Friday. Um, that's the expectation that we have um, in the field right now about um, what um, will be allowable for summer programming. So uh, in the meantime, we're working on just a number of contingency plans of if um, Secretary French says this, what can we have in place? Um, we have some meetings already scheduled um, with the SU leadership next week to talk about um, if we get the, when we get the guidance of like what can we do within the um, the limitations or the um, recommendations that we have, um, and then working with the building principals and stuff to to see how we're going to adapt our programs to and what we're able to offer uh, the youth in the community this summer. That's where we're at right now. I just want to add, Heather has been pretty creative in her thinking about this, and it's pretty it's it's like picking out your wardrobe in you know a dark room you can't really see what's ahead of you so her her and her team are really trying to just be as creative as they can and be positioned well so once we get that guidance we'll be able to pretty quickly navigate into a plan um and i think that with all the contingencies she has come up with i think we're positioned pretty pretty well to be able to do that yeah we'll definitely be able to uh, put a very solid program together once we're told um, what our guidelines are. Um, and I've been working very closely with other 21C directors across the state. Um, so we're just, um, you know, using each other's sound boards, seeing what um, our opportunities, seeing what resources uh, they have available, just sharing uh, curriculum ideas, um, and um, trying to just go through of like, the, if we change this in the program, how does it affect something else? making sure that um, we just don't have any loose ends with whatever plan we end up moving forward with. Great, thanks so much, Heather, I appreciate that. So moving on, Jamie, you're up next. Okay, can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, um, well, we sent teacher contracts out on April 16th and they were due back on Friday, May 1st. Um, we got most of them back. We have, I think, 17 extensions remaining. Um, they have till May 15th to get those contracts back. Um, we've been hiring, and they, I think we've hired about 22 new staff members so far right now. Um, we still have some vacancies left to fill. And I know Lynn's going to talk more about the hiring and resignations. Um, so yeah, that's what's been going on for the last few weeks. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Appreciate it. Uh, so uh, food service uh, report from Dawn. Hi. So, um, we have four sites up and running serving all seven of our communities. The staff are working four days a week to prepare and package uh, the meals for our families within all of our communities. Uh, meals are delivered on Tuesdays and Fridays, and um, that's the meals that they'll get for the entire week, breakfast and lunches for the entire week. Um, in Montgomery, staff are preparing meals for people who are at shelters and are now being housed at the crossing in Richford. Um, they're being served two times a week. These meals are breakfast, lunch, and supper for seven days a week. Montgomery staff is doing a wonderful job with that task I've given them. Um, any breakfast and lunches served to children 18 and under, 18 and younger, Monday through Friday are claimed through the summer meals program. All of the other meals are reimbursed by a different program within the state of Vermont. That was a task that the state had called and asked if I had any um, interest in one of our kitchens being able to take that on. And Montgomery has jumped up and said they were very willing to do that. And 
they've really done an awesome job with that. They've owned the program and owned that part of it and are really shining on that. So it's nice to have that. Um, on April 3rd, I had planned a food service training for food safety with COVID restrictions and being tasked with meal delivery. That training was canceled. Uh, however, during the month of April, SurfSafe was offering the same training free of charge. So kitchen staff were asked to complete the training. Not only did all complete this task and pass the test at the end, but are now SurfSafe certified until April 2023 at no additional cost to our program. So that was a huge um, thing just to get that accomplished along with doing their meals and everything that they've done. Um, during the month of April, our site served a total of 67,346 meals. So that's huge. That, that, was, that was a great number. Uh, I have the breakdown for you where I kind of uh, took in, compared the programs that we're serving now compared to our February numbers, because I didn't really feel that March were a good set of numbers because the last few days we had a lot of kids that were out. So in Berkshire, under the summer feeding program, they're feeding 243 students on an average daily attendance. Just in the National School Lunch Program, that number would have been 135. So we know that some of those students are high school students that go to Enosburg and Richford. So that's where some of the numbers fluctuate some, but that's a large um, increase in meals. Bakersfield normally under the school lunch program would serve 81. Enosburg Elementary would normally serve 200. Enosburg Middle High School would normally serve 235 and Sheldon would normally serve uh, Sheldon's number is let me I, I gotta switch to a different screen here Sheldon's number is normally 143 so the reason I'm breaking those down together is because all of those meals now are coming out of the Enosburg site that Enosburg site is serving 755 meals. So that means they're serving 755 lunches and 755 breakfast each day. So on a delivery, which is going out on Tuesday, they are timesing that number by three because we are sending out three meals at a time. So there, that's huge for uh, Richford to be, or Enosburg to take and be doing that many meals. Uh, Richford Elementary normally would serve 132, and Richford Junior Senior High School would normally serve 166. Their number has gone up to 387. And then Montgomery would normally serve 116, and their number has gone up to 132 plus all of the crossing meals. So just to give you an idea, under the NSLP program in February, we served 1,208 lunches. Under the summer feeding program in the month of April, we served 1,517 lunches on an average day. So the staff has really come above and beyond and are really doing an awesome job getting these meals out there to the families. Can I just say one thing? I have never been so thankful for a hire than I was with the board moving to hire a food service director this year. Had we gone into this COVID response without someone to really lead this part of the effort, it, it definitely wouldn't be what it is right now. So I just want to applaud Don for, I think you said 67,346 and you're coordinating all of the, you know, on the ground detail of how that's going down and all of the ordering and, and things that are associated. I know there's a ton of paperwork associated with that too. So we appreciate you, Don. And I appreciate this SU board for moving forward with that position. So integral. Yeah, Don, I really, it's just remarkable what you all are doing and how hard everyone is working to provide such a vital uh, service right now in these really challenging times. I'm just, I'm so moved by it and I really, 
I really appreciate your efforts and everyone in those kitchens. And I know how hard everyone's working. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. It's, it's amazing of the work that is done. And there, my ch two children are receiving this benefit. And I want to tell you as a parent, it's always right. We always get exactly what, like, I'm not missing this or getting an extra one for some kid or something. It's always right. So I, I don't know how you're doing it. Like, it's almost mind boggling, but it's perfect. So thank you so, so much. Okay. Um, anything further, Dawn? Or you're, you're all set? No, I think I'm all set. Okay, super. All right. So moving on, Morgan with a financial business report. So I sent out uh, financial reports for April to you all by email. Um, I can take any questions now or offline, but I just wanted to walk you through the, the two reports. Um, one is specific to the special ed program, and then the other one is specific to the general fund, which is largely central office transportation and the food service program. Um, on that sheet that you got, um, the first, actually the first two lines are the approved budget um, from back in November, I guess, um, of the year prior. Um, and then that last column is my best guess at where we're gonna end the year um, knowing what we know now. So, uh, for the looking at the general fund first, if um, if you look down about halfway down page one, um, you'll see we were expecting to take in a total of 2.6 million in revenue per um, central office, and that includes all the assessments from the districts. Uh, we were going to spend about 2.4, 2.5 million of that. And so we were going to be to the good $146,000 in that budget. Um, conversely, in the food service program, we were expecting to lose that same amount. And that's how I budget this so that we can assess out that difference. And that's basically the cost of moving to universal meals for uh, five of our six towns. If you look at um, uh, the last column, uh, anticipated year end, I'm basically uh, guessing that on the central office side, we are going to end both in expenses and in revenues about where we budgeted. Um, there are still a few things that are out there. Uh, I am making projections on spending for the last two months. Um, and the only real storm cloud that I see on the horizon is that last week we were supposed to get our last installment of state aid for transportation, which is about $130,000. And that has not come through yet. And I have not gotten an answer as to why that hasn't come through yet. So um, we're kind of paying attention to that. But if you look at food service, um, you'll see instead of anticipating that we're going to lose um, 146,000 out of that pocket, I'm now projecting we're only going to lose about 33,000 out of that pocket, and that is largely due to the reimbursement and the sheer volume of meals that uh, Dawn is putting out through this COVID summer feeding. Um, so that's a bright spot, and that means that. Um, that the SU general fund should be uh, ending in a good place at the end of this year. Um, again, in the food service, there's a lot of questions still in that I really haven't adjusted my guesses for what we're spending in terms of food because of this new program. Uh, we're probably spending more in some areas and less in others, um, but I'm certainly a lot more confident on where we're gonna end than where I was in January. Um, if you look at the special ed budget, um, it's certainly a better picture than uh, I've brought you in the past. I think I'm still showing a small deficit at the end of the year, um, if uh, 29,000. 
I am guessing that that's going to disappear. Um, Michelle and Lynn especially are working hard with NCSS around renegotiating some of those contracts that we have and I've not um, built in any savings from that. So I do think that our expenses are going to come down. Um, the question mark we have around revenue, and this is maybe more, I think it's still more paranoia for Lynn and, and Michelle and I, rather than anything tangible, is um, if the state is going to look to solve some of its current year funding crisis, by reducing the amount of money they give to us in special ed reimbursable expenses. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, but at this point, I'm not building anything into that. I'm just assuming that we're gonna get the money that we're due and that we're gonna pay out the contracts as we think we're gonna pay them out now. Um, so again, that number's a little better than you've seen in the past. And certainly the numbers at central office are are largely better because of the food service. Um, any questions on that? Could I just add something in there, Morgan? Yep. I think that the part on the SU budget about transportation is we've been um, asking this question for several weeks now. The, the statute says that the state transportation aid is based on transporting students to and from school so there's some question about whether or not all of our costs that are associated with transporting meals during this time if those will be eligible expenses for that transportation aid um, it is transportation aid is one of those things that's on a two-year i think it's a rolling average so there we're not getting clarity on that and we're about a week late getting that transportation aid so um we're just oh, we may have lost her um so i will talk a little bit next about um what's looking in the future but you know my gut tells me if there's an issue at this point it may have more to do with cash flow from the state rather than that oh. Carefully, and in terms of the so I think it's going to be an issue this year more of cash flow, um, and the state is not yet having the money in the right place to to pay out districts than um, than anything that's going to be a, a long term impact for this budget year. Um, but I don't know that for sure. Um, so are there any other questions on this year and this year's expenses? Is my internet back? Can you hear me now? It's a little better now. Okay. I'm going to try this one more time because I just want to clarify uh, the NCSS part. So it's not so much negotiating a lesser contract with them. It is about um, the way we receive our aid is based on a reimbursement model for services that have been provided. Some of the services in when you're in person learning um, can't happen in this remote learning. So for example, our, some of our bills that we pay to SOAR Learning Center for Transportation um, and to SOAR Learning Center for one-on-one for -on -one paraeducator support for students, those can't be provided during this time. So we've been working with NCSS to reduce some of those costs. Uh, some of the other pieces are we're just looking, um, we're working collaboratively to try to identify some of the other areas um, where during the time period between our, when we're in that maintenance of learning phase, whether or not there were um, services that were being billed for that haven't been provided. We're not looking to, you know, to sink them, but at the same time, we're also trying to be really cautious with um, being strategic about communicating with our with our partner because we expect that some of these associated costs um, might not be we might not receive that revenue for it so NCSS has been great they've been working with us on this and we're we're trying to come up to come up with a mutually agreeable um, place somewhere in the middle
So Lynn and I are going to tag team the discussion on um, the picture for FY21 and beyond. And uh, we were both on a, a video conference with the Joint Fiscal Office today. And I know Mary was on that. Jean Marie may have been on that as well. So um, other folks can jump in. Um, I think the I won't get into the specific numbers for next year because we will be getting that uh, in a format that we can share with the boards tomorrow. And we'll just push that out to you. Um, but I think the short story is that um, the revenue problems around um, the changes in our state uh, in our society around COVID um, for this year still seem to be really about cash flow for the state rather than impacting your budgets. Um, but in FY21, where you've got budgets already passed, um, there's a pretty significant hole that they need to fill. And the, the obvious way to do that would be to, to jack the, to push the yield amount way down and jack your tax rates way up. Um, I don't think that's ultimately what's going to happen. And what they were talking about today was that if they did that, they're trying to figure out a way to say to voters, this is the, the tax rate that you, um, that you approved at your town meeting. And then this is the difference due to the COVID crisis. So that will give you guys a little political cover if, um, if it comes to that. But, um, but I think Lynn and I, we talked afterwards and I think we we're both a little bit more relieved after this call than on previous calls. And that um, my take is that there are a lot of solutions now on the table um, to deal with this crisis and they're not all sort of screwing the local districts, which um, is what it kind of felt like in those first um, first updates. Um, so the state has, um, has several options open to it. Um, they are talking about borrowing as a state to kind of um, to spread that pain over two or three years, um, which would alleviate the need for um, either you to borrow or for your taxpayers to see a, a large increase. Um, I think they may open up the idea of not funding this um, reserve that they're required to refill each year according to statute, and that would give them a little bit more breathing room if they, they didn't do that. Um, and then I think they are still looking at ways for this um, federal money that's coming down to, um, to figure out how they can get as much of that and hold it at the state level to, um, to fund this revenue shortfall. Um, Lynn, I don't know if you wanna add anything else onto that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you, the outlook is certainly still grim and we're facing some really tough financial times ahead. The difference in this call is they were more transparent about some of their thinking around how they can uh, respond to this anticipated deficit in the education fund. Uh, the other piece that was clear is that Peter Welsh's, uh, one of his staffers was on the call with us and he was talking, we were talking about the CARES Act money, and he was also talking about the next wave of response money coming out of Congress. And he, he believes that, you know, they're looking further down the road for more federal relief, and they're going to try to make that federal relief have greater flexibilities for states to be able to use that relief money in ways that could help with what the real issues are. Uh, at the state level, which for us in Vermont would be filling the deficit in the education fund. So I, that was the first I had heard that there is likely more money coming behind the CARES Act. I don't know, Mary, or if there's anybody else that was on that call, if they have anything to add. Well, that was my general takeaway too. I mean, it's it's definitely dire, but it seems like there's a more kind of strategic, big picture, longer range kind of thinking um, happening, like you just said, Lynn. So uh, I, I, it seems slightly, I mean, the deficit has what tripled <laughs> since we had our first webinar in 
late March, early April. So that certainly the number is a little shocking, but it does seem as though um, they'll, there will be strategies for kind of helping um, brace the impact on our, on our tax, on our taxpayers for one. And um, you know, that, that seems comforting, but a lot is unknown and you know, it also some of those strategies they were talking about involve a, a functional Congress in D.C. actually pushing money out to states and, you know, that that need it. So a lot to be determined for sure. Yeah, I definitely think Morgan's right about the, the thinking about restoring the reserve fund. I think that they, are, they have the ability to... Uh, as a legislative body, make a decision not to restore that fully. And I think that that, that helps. Um, and, and I definitely think that, you know, there, there is some uncertainty, but I, I feel like they're getting closer to what that real number is. I think I heard uh, Mark say at one point during the call that this number is less likely to move as much as what we were anticipating before. I think they're getting closer to what they, what they think it's actually going to be. So maybe if more people buy those uh, lottery tickets, it's about the only thing we could do in those consumption uh, tax <laughs> categories at this point. Uh, that's the part that's just crushing the education fund is the, the change because of our stay home orders, the change in all the consumption taxes throughout the state. Morgan, anything else on the financial side of things? Um, I've got one motion that I'm looking for, um, and that is a motion to authorize the approval of FNESU warrants electronically. Um, now both towns have, uh, both districts have done that, and we just need to get that motion on the books um, at the SC level. Okay, uh, I'll make that motion to approve uh, warrants uh, electronically. Any yeah. discussion? All in favor? I can't aye. see a few people. It's G. Marie, I. And Rick. Yep. And I and Kevin. Yeah, good. Perfect. Great. All right. And that's all anything, I got. Anything else? Okay. All right, Lynn, you are up. Okay, so I sent you just before the meeting the 2021 school calendar for FNESU. Uh, so there's just a couple of changes I want to talk through on this. So for us, it's not a typical start to the year in terms of calendar because of where Labor Day falls. So we will have that first uh, three day week, then we'll have a full five day week, and then Labor Day falls in the uh, second week or the third week of school. We, I asked you for approval earlier this uh, spring or winter around the use of early release days next year. So you'll see that embedded in that calendar on October 2nd and in February 5th. We'll have our first two early release days. Uh, we'll be working with Heather and her staff to provide options for families who need uh, support for kids on those afternoons. So there will be some activities available to kids that need to stay straight through. Uh, last week, we made the shift to Thanksgiving break, having um, two student days, and we hadn't done that in a while, and I think that that was received pretty favorably. So we have maintained that. We made one shift this year, and that was uh, December 21st and 22nd. Those are not super productive student days, just before uh, the holiday time in December. So we've decided to make both of those days in-service days. So we'll have an SU in-service uh, and then a local in-service. The rest of the calendar is pretty standard, something that you're, you're used to seeing. So this has all of the SU in-service days that it equals up to four in-service days. And each of the individual schools create their own calendar and they embed the six other in-service days into their own calendar. Any questions on this? 
So we just ask for a motion to approve the 2021 calendar. I'll make that motion. All in favor? This is Jean Marie. Aye. Great. So I think technically we're supposed to roll call this when we're on. Um, oh, okay. Meeting. Okay, so let's do that again. Kevin, you made the motion. All in favor? Mary, aye. Rick, aye. Emily, Jean aye. Marie. Jean Marie, aye. I, even though I made it, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay. So Morgan has talked a lot about um, the financial outlook already, and um, which we, we knew would happen. Uh, we always kind of overlap on the financial stuff. So I think that I'm going to just skip that piece for now. There's going to be some, I'm going to go over some staffing stuff there. That's the last part of my agenda. And one of the things that we have to do as we're moving forward in this, this year is to be really thoughtful about every decision that we're going to make as it impacts next year. So when we go through staffing, we'll talk more about that. So one of the things that has come up uh, is that it's likely we're hearing that you know, we could be in this place of school looking different uh, than it has historically looked in public schools until we get to a place where there's a, a vaccine or COVID-19. So we know that we have some staff members who are at higher risk than other staff members. And historically in the master agreement, we require teachers to let us know if they're considering retiring by December 1st. We know we have several staff members who are eligible for full retirement, but they last year did not choose to submit a request for retirement. Given the change in this time period and the additional risks associated with uh, people over 60 being exposed in communities, I'm gonna recommend to the board that you extend that period in which staff members can notify you of their intent to retire for this next school year and still receive the benefits outlined in the master agreement to June 1 in light of the health and safety risk for our higher, um, for our higher risk staff members. Any discussion on that? Lynn, you'd like a motion for that, eh? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I think it makes a lot of sense and is a very prudent um, and thoughtful move. So I will make that motion to uh, extend the date until June 1st uh, for someone to uh, ask for retirement. So all in favor, we'll do a roll call. That will be just this for this year only, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, that's fine. Emily? Aye. Jean Marie, Jean Marie, aye. Okay, and Mary, aye. So I'm just gonna quickly go through uh, the personnel. I've outlined all of it for you. I went through with Jamie earlier today to just update. So what you received in my board notes has been modified just slightly. So you, you have two retirements that you've already accepted. So I'm just reminding you of those retirements. Hey, you hey, have three Oops. Can I, can I ask you a question? It's related to the, a little bit to the last thing and maybe you're going to bring it up. Uh, but there's a, there might be an other group of employees that you need to think about maybe. And that's somebody that's immunocompromised or for some other reason, the coronavirus may uh, bother more. Uh, and I don't know if you've thought about those employees or not. We, we have thought about them, but not in terms of the retirement benefit because your retirement benefit is so specific to 
the number of years that they've served within FNESU. Uh, I mean, that's something if you wanted to explore that, that, that would be something you'd have to give me some guidance on. Yeah, not so much. Right now, Oops. Right yeah, now I they have a, Go ahead. Sorry. They have the ability <laughs> to, to not be reporting to work if they have a dem demonstrated immunocompromised situation or they're caring for someone that falls into that category. So they're not mandated to be physically present in the building. Um, but I think what, you, tell me more about what you're suggesting. Yeah, so uh, for those individual individuals, are we gonna, um, do, we, do we need to find replacements for them or are we gonna try to do some online type thing where, where maybe the teacher uh, is not physically present but has an online presence in the school how, how do you think that that would work uh i think that we have guidance that we're going to be receiving from the agency in terms of next year i think that it would be premature for me to tell you how i think it's going to work because one i don't know what the what the circumstance of our year is going to look like I think if there is a way that we can structure it so that someone can still do their do their job and function in that role, that's what we will we will do. Uh, we also right now are in a situation where the governor has told us that we have to pay people uh, no matter what during this time period. So I think that I don't know what if next year looks uh, different than it typically does. I don't know what his recommendation will be around the pay part. So I don't know how much we have flexibility, how much flexibility we have, Rick, in terms of our response to that. I feel like that's gonna come from state level guidance. Yeah, uh, and so it, this is, kind of, well, okay. Uh, I guess we can't do anything without guidance anyway, but uh, so, you know, you have a first grade teacher that's immunocompromised, you know, <laughs> do we need to fill that position? I mean, because it's not like we're going to get to August and say, you know, oh, we can't, you know, this person can't work. We need to hire a replacement. We got two weeks to do it. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I definitely do. Okay. Adding that up to my list uh, to ask about on Thursday in our meeting and we'll put it on our brainstorming list from our local response plan as well. Okay. And I think the other piece of that is that currently we're in this very reactive mode to um, to COVID and the response and the impact on people. Um, by fall, a lot of those issues may come up and maybe um, things that we need to deal with under disability law, which is an entirely different animal. And so, um, I don't even know if we're gonna we're gonna get guidance until we're sort of all mentally making that shift. We'll at least get guidance about what the what the year might look like, or what the start of the year might look like. It, is there any precedent? I mean, this is a totally unprecedented experience, but is there a precedent if a staff member or a teacher feels as though you know their health and safety are compromised by being visit you know in in the school building because if we're all back to school for the 2021 20, year then and that's you know the governor's order and we're kind of back to whatever the new normal is it's i don't i mean i'm just it's so curious it yeah rick you raised a really interesting question about well what if someone doesn't feel physically safe to come to work and be in the building but the you know we're back to business as normal as possible i think that's one of those situations that we would be looking to our legal team to try to provide us guidance with as well i think it would you know we want to make sure that we take care of our employees at the same time we want to make sure that we're we're acting within the bounds of our legal responsibilities as well yeah. Um, so, um, are you good on that one, Rick? Yeah, I'm good. We don't know. <laughs> I'm good with it. 
So we've had to get really good at being okay with, with the we're not sure yet. We have to wait for wait for some more guidance. So it, the welcome to what we've been living with the last several weeks. So uh, no actions necessary on the retirement. You do have three resignations that I would ask you to act upon. And that is Vincent Ionico, Mary Trihorn, and Emily Grimms. And Lynn, you need motions for those resignations? Yes. So you only have Vincent and Mary listed on the agenda here. The other person was Emily Grimms, you said? Yeah, so your your list was the best I had on the day that I gave it to you uh, over, I think, a week ago. So you're going to see some, I'll tell you where there are changes. Emily is the addition in this category here. Okay. Can, uh, can it be one blanket or should I do, should we do a motion for each individual uh, person? I think you could blanket it. Okay. So I'll make the motion to accept the res resignations of Vincent Inaco, mm -hmm. uh, Mary Trihorn, and Emily Grimms. All in favor? Roll call. Emily, aye. Jean Marie, aye. Rick, aye. Mary, aye. Was that everybody? We're all good. That was everyone. Okay. In terms of hiring, we have four SU positions that we have already filled. One is Anna Tracy, interventionist at Richford Elementary School. Tina Russett, special educator at Richford Junior Senior High School. Melissa Davis, special educator at Enosburg Falls High School. And Nicholas DeVita, school psychologist and SEL coordinator. So I would ask the board uh, to approve hiring of the new SU staff members. Uh, I'll make that motion to approve the um, the hires that Lynn just listed. Do you want me, Lynn, to go through the names again? Um, who's taking notes? Caroline. Caroline, do you need her to say Amanda. those again? Amanda. Oh, sorry. I'm all set. Okay. You're all set. Okay, so we'll make that motion. All in favor? Roll call. Emily, aye. Gavin, I. Rick, I. Jean, Jean Marie, I. And Mary, I. So we went through all of the extension requests that we had within the supervisory union, and we have uh, five remaining uh, Michelle Green, Kim Hoffman, Viviana Hardy. Claudia Woodward and Ann Morey. You had one addition and one deletion there. So that's just informational for you. So all that means is that they have, uh, they're likely exploring other professional opportunities. So they have two additional weeks to follow through with um, hiring um, timelines for other positions. And the last thing I'll talk about under personnel is the remaining open positions that we have in the SU. So the board had approved an early childhood director in this year's budget. Um, I think that given where we are financially, I want to say, first of all, this is a position that I think we really need. We have um, identified this need for many years and we're thrilled to have the opportunity to explore that in this budget. But given where we are financially, I don't think it's responsible for us to move forward with filling a full-time early childhood director position for next year. I do think that it's worthwhile for us to explore whether or not there are opportunities for us to partner with some of the other supervisory unions or supervisory districts in our area to explore some sort of a regional partnership or contracting out a certain part of those responsibilities that an early childhood uh, director could um, fill. So 
the other piece that we talked about is whether or not we have the capacity to consider making that a part of someone's role, hiring someone on who's less than full time to fill some of the other positions that we still have open and at least doing a part of the director role for for someone. It's not ideal, but I think it's the most responsible thing for us to do for this next year. So thoughts on not filling that? Can I assume that you are in agreement if you're not saying anything? I agree. Yeah, Lynn, I, I think it's wise to hold off, even though it's been a long time need, but given the financial terrain that we find ourselves on, um, waiting a bit may, may, may is probably the more prudent path. Just for a point of information, um, we did have a great candidate, so it is kind of a bummer because we we did we did um, interview and we did have someone who would have been wonderful. So this timing is stinks. You can say more it. than stinks. Yes. <laughs> so I still want the flexibility to be able to explore how to contract out some of the functions that are really critical because we really don't have the expertise uh, and capacity in other uh, directors at central office to be able to fulfill some of those functions. So there are other SUs in the area who have directors and they have expressed some willingness to work with us. So I want to explore that further uh, and or the potential of weaving these responsibilities into a uh, new position that we're still looking for. So actually, next... actually, Lynn, if you really are, well, I mean, do what, do what you think, but I'd be more interested in if you could weave it in, to, you know, if you had somebody that you, somebody that you really like, you know, that you thought could take over the position, but for a while would have to weave into one of these other unfilled positions, that would seem better to me than contracting it out, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it would definitely be a preference of ours, too. It's just the reality of whether or not the just right candidate will be satisfied with something less than a full-time director position. So I, I would want to do that for the right person, Rick. But if it wasn't the right person, I think I would be more interested in exploring experience and contracting somewhere else. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Oops. Yeah, it does. So uh, other open positions, uh, early childhood special educator, we still have uh, that open. We also have uh, LEAPS program coordinator at Berkshire that's open. We have, um, we are advertising for an anticipated school psychologist position. One of the people who has asked for an extension is a school psychologist in uh, Sheldon specifically. So we have, because it's such a hard fill position, we have advertised that as anticipated. We have a special educator position still open and we now have a speech and language pathologist uh, position open given the resignation, one of the resignations you just approved so that that's kind of our update there's nothing left in those hiring categories that I feel like I should, could say to you we really don't need that because I think that they they all really fall into that realm of student service and I think that it's clear to all of us that the need for student services is going to be uh, even greater when we return to some semblance of normal when this is over uh, so it's certainly reducing in those areas doesn't feel like the the best decision for us at this time. There is one thing that I forgot to say earlier when we were talking about the financial piece. The other thing that we had budgeted this year was a transportation study to just look at efficiency in our in our transportation routes throughout the supervisory union. And I think that's another area where we can 
hit the pause on that for a year. Um, I think that it makes sense for us to just not spend out that money in this next budget cycle uh, and then revisit. I would hope that when we're able to, when the financial outlook is a little better, we can revisit both the early childhood director position and the transportation study down the road. Does it make sense? Absolutely. Last up is the ratification of the teacher collective bargaining agreement. So Morgan sent that out to you. I think that uh, um, we had, um, I think three of you on this call were on uh, the negotiation team. The negotiation team met with the teachers twice. The last time was a bit of a marathon session. I think we were five plus hours that night trying to get through uh, negotiating that agreement. Uh, and I think that we landed in a fair place for both the teachers and for the board. I don't know if there's anything. Rick was the chief negotiator. Is there anything that you would like to add in there, Rick? No, I think it went really well, actually. Um, I was pretty happy with the outcome. I think that everybody seemed to work pretty well together. So it came, it came out fine. Any question on the agreement? I only looked quickly at those side letters, but those are all old side letters that just have to be signed each time we renegotiate must be, I'm assuming. Yes. You know my love of side letters, right? We, we know. And, and <laughs> those are things that you are unlikely to get rid of because they were negotiated in those previous agreements. Uh, right. Until they're kind of sunset. They go into a sunset place where as those people retire. Gotcha. Thank you. So, Lynn, you need a motion for accepting the um, the bargaining agreement, yes? Or to ratify. To ratify it. Let's say ratify okay. the agreement and the side letters and give you authority to sign away from the table. I'll make the motion. Uh, all in favor, we'll do a roll call. Emily, aye. Kevin, aye. Jean Marie, aye. Rick, aye. And Mary, aye. Morgan, I just want to clarify uh, that's for Mary to sign away from the table, or is it Rick because he was chief negotiator? Uh, it's Mary. Okay. So one of the things I would like to talk about next is universal school meals. We had a conversation in the fall, um, in the late fall, about Sheldon and considering adding universal school meals in Sheldon. Right now, they're the only community that we have. Uh, when they joined us, they were still paying for meals. They were doing the free and reduced lunch like many of the schools. We had made a move a couple of years ago to shift to provision two or community eligibility provision in order to be able to provide free breakfast and lunch to all of our students. So through the lens of equity, it's something I wanted to bring back to the board to consider. I think that it's more important now than ever for us to be thinking about this because of what we know some of our families are facing in all of our towns. And I think that uh, meals are something. We've been able to do free meals for all Sheldon kids because of the way Dawn was able to navigate uh, our application and how we were producing those meals. So looking forward into next year, knowing that the financial implications of COVID-19 are not only gonna impact us as a supervisory union, but also it's gonna impact families for a long time to come as well. So I'm just asking the board to consider 
uh, allowing us to move forward with applying for universal school meals for Sheldon. Do you need a motion to move forward? Yes. I will make that motion. Okay. Do we um, know the financial impact? Um, we don't really. Um, there are two different funding schemes um, for going to universal meals. And right now we've got three of our schools on what's called uh, CEP or community eligibility provision or program. And then the others are on provision two. Um, one of the likely side benefits, I guess, of the, the COVID crisis is that we are seeing an uptick right now in terms of our families who are getting three squares or reach up or some of those um, state programs that feed into your direct cert list that feed into the community eligibility program. So um, this month and next, Don and I are sort of working that list pretty hard. And I think we're gonna be able to move, you know, maybe two or three or four of our schools from provision two to community eligibility, which will increase um, the reimbursement rates that we get for that. Um, it kind of doesn't matter which of the schools that we put in there in terms of what the kids see, um, but we we can kind of game the numbers. So whichever school um, would benefit the most, um, we'll move those in first. Morgan, what's the percentage of kids at Sheldon who are on free and reduced? Uh, I'm guessing Dawn and I can race to see who can come up with that first. Uh, I'm going to guess that it's in the low to mid 30s. And Sheldon might be one that we decide to move to couple with other schools and move into the community eligibility program um, because Title I eligibility um, sort of has two different um, gates that you have to meet. One is 35% and one is 40%. Um, to get the funds and then to be able to use them in a school-wide program. Um, Sheldon's currently on a waiver for that, so the 30-something percent doesn't really bother us now, but two years from now, we want to make sure that that number starts with a four. Any further discussion? That uh, Emily has that motion on the table. Okay, so we'll do a roll call then. Emily, aye. Kevin, aye. Jean Marie, aye. Rick, aye. And Mary, aye. Thank you, everyone. The last um, thing I have has to do with negotiations for central office staff so i cannot do that in open session the only one that i would like to stay with me for at least part of the executive session will be morgan um, and i think when i don't know if you're going to want um amanda to stay on or do, can we just give amanda kind of the last bit of our meeting if there's any action Are you okay with us letting Amanda go as well, Mary? Yeah, of course. Okay. So can I have Jamie stay in the waiting room though? Yeah, so the way this works is that everybody who's not an executive, um, I'll put in the waiting room. And then when the board comes out of executive, I'll let everybody who's left um, back in. Actually, just, Lynn will when I leave because I'll make Lynn the host and then she can put me in the waiting room. I just want to say there's no expectation that you stay uh, to the administrators. You're welcome to if you want to, but you definitely don't have to stay. Okay, so um, I can make that motion to move into executive session 
do a roll call. Emily, aye. Kevin, aye. Jean Marie, aye. Rick, aye. Mary, aye. So um, I'll make the motion uh, for Lynn to move forward as per executive session regarding uh, contracts for, for central office staff. So all Emily in favor I. by roll call? Emily, I. Kevin, I. Jean Marie, I. Rick, I. Mary, I. I have, um, before we end, I have one additional, um, I forgot something earlier when we were talking about personnel, and that is Jeremy Sanborn has been hired as a behavior specialist um, and will be working at Richford Elementary School. So I would ask for the board to make a motion to approve hiring of Jeremy Sanborn. I'll make that motion. Great. Um, all in favor by roll call? Emily, aye. Kevin, aye. Jean Marie, aye. Rick, aye. And Mary, aye. That's all I have for you. I got one quick question. Do we need to reorganize? Oh, it wasn't on the agenda. Oh, this is the funniest thing that's happened to me all day. <laughs> <laughs> Next month. That I was guess. the furthest thing. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Yeah, mine too. So we probably should warn the board reorganization. Oops, we're usually really on top of can, that. Can we do it under other board business? Probably not. Um, I think it's I think it's better to wait. I don't think you had any um, any open positions you needed to fill, so I'm not especially concerned. We're going to have to talk about editing. We'll talk later. Okay, so we'll do that at the next the next meeting, which is when are we doing when are we meeting next in June? Wait, is this really our first uh, meeting since town meeting? We haven't reorg yet. Yeah, I think it might. I don't know if it was our first, we, yeah, it's our first meeting, I think, isn't it? But we have No, that. it's our second. We had that emergency one. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Three days after town meeting. Yeah. It, did we, we didn't reorg then? Okay. Sorry, I was trying to cover us. Yeah. We will fix this. have it on the agenda for next time. I don't know when the next one is, uh, Mary. I'm wondering if we want to get a little further um, into the discussion of where we're going to land financially. I'm wondering if it is a, a June. I don't anticipate. Could be a June or a July. Okay. Well, do we want to leave it as a TBD? Yeah. And then we can do reorganization at that time. Yes. Okay, anything further under board business? No? Motion to all adjourn. Set, all set, motion to adjourn. All in favor by roll call? Emily, aye. Kevin, I. Jean Marie, I. Rick, I. And Mary, I.